Non-planar slicing has been a buzzword in the 3D printer community for years, but now it's truly here. No more demos using manually written G-code, slices that can only slice certain shapes, or 3.5 axis toolpaths. This is the S4 slicer, an open source, generic, non-planar slicer that can print any object without supports. Many existing non-planar slicers rely on a human to plan the toolpath, whether that's by defining the surfaces to slice along, or by splitting the part into segments that can be printed with planar slicing. On the other hand, my non-planar slicer algorithm is entirely automated. Given any arbitrary model, it is able to determine the best way to slice the non-planar layers to ensure printability and minimize support usage. Watching the simultaneous four-axis toolpaths that this slicer generates is absolutely hypnotic. I'm still blown away with how the nozzle organically moves around the part to slowly build it up, taking paths that would be simply impossible for a human to generate by hand. A point that I really want to hammer home is that this slicer isn't just a demo. It can be used to print out functional parts or complex designs, the kinds of things I use my 3D printers for. In true RepRap fashion, let's print out a part from my core R theater printer. This is a B-axis mount, quite an awkward part to print on a traditional 3D printer. Normally I would print it in this orientation, but that puts the layer lines perpendicular to the torque forces on the part and requires support. On the other hand, the S4 slicer allows us to orient the part this way, which would be completely unthinkable with a normal slicer. But now, as you can see, the layers are in a better direction to handle the forces on the part and no support is needed. The S4 slicer is also quite well suited for miniatures, which are often designed with aesthetics, not printability, in mind. This squirtle looks cute, but it would be a pain to print with the FDM printer because of its huge unsupported overhangs. The S4 slicer has no issues with it, however. And the same is true for this baby T-Rex model. But the real magnum opus of this slicer is obviously the upside down benchy, which I'm very proud of. It has some crazy toolpaths, and I'll get into how I managed to print this later in the video, which you really don't want to miss. A key limitation of my original printer was that the nozzle could only rotate 90 degrees outwards because of the end stop something which would have prevented me from printing my upside down benchy, which has 180 degree overhangs. So I reached out to JLC CNC who helped me create these beautiful new extruder mounts, which have the end stops on the other side. They are CNC'd out of aluminium, making them ultra light and strong. They also provide an anodization service, which I use to make the parts red so it fits in with the rest of the printer. I've been using JLC PCB for years now and have always had a good experience with them. They also have metal 3D printing and PCB services, which I use for the previous steel version of the extruder mount and the aluminium PCB print bed. Getting CNC parts from JLC CNC is super simple. Just upload your CAD file, select what material you want to mill out of, and it'll be made in just a few days. In my case, it only took three days to make these extruder brackets, which is pretty incredible. So a big thanks to JLC CNC for sponsoring this video and also providing some really great cheap services. Now back to the video. Given how complex these toolpaths are, you might be surprised by how simple the theory behind the slicer is. In fact, it all runs from a single Jupyter notebook, which you can run yourself. Let's quickly go through the algorithm because I think it's too interesting to skip. From a very high level, we're performing a few simple steps. Firstly, we deform our input mesh to remove all of the overhangs. We then slice the deformed mesh with a conventional slicer to get the G-code toolpath. And then finally, we untransform the G-code back into the original shape, giving us our curved layers. This is exactly the same method I used for my simple radial slicer from my last video, except that the radial slicer could only deform the model in very simple ways, unlike this new generic non-planar slicer that I built. Zooming into the process, we first convert our triangle mesh into a tetrahedral mesh, which defines the object's volume. We then create a graph of the tetrahedral mesh, consisting of the tetrahedrons and their neighbors. Each connection is labeled with the physical distance between the two tetrahedrons. This graph allows us to run Dijkstra's to find the shortest path to the print bed for every tetrahedron in the mesh, which is pretty sick. We'll refer to this distance as the tetrahedron's path length property. We want to print from the base outwards, i.e. from lower to higher path length properties. Therefore, we calculate the gradient of this property by fitting a plane to the path length properties and finding which way slopes down. This gives the direction we should rotate every tetrahedron in to make the overhangs printable. We now want this rotation field to be smooth, so we use a nonlinear optimizer that tweaks the rotations of every tetrahedron to minimize the difference in rotation between it and its neighbors. This is a super simple concept, but we're often working with tens of thousands of tetrahedrons, so the code needs to be really efficient. We then convert this rotation field into a continuous deformed mesh by framing it as another optimization problem. This time we're tweaking the locations of the individual vertices in the mesh to try and make every tetrahedron have the correct rotation, while also keeping the neighbors connected. This finally results in our deformed mesh, which we can slice and cure to get our G-code toolpath. Our final step is to untransform this toolpath from cure into the shape of the original mesh. Every point in the toolpath lies within a tetrahedron in the deformed mesh, and we know how to untransform each one of these vertices, 
So we use a weighted combination of each of these transformations to move the toolpath point back into its place in the original mesh. We have some extra logic to prevent collisions during travel moves and extrusion compensation for the stretching and squishing that's going on, but after all of this, we get our final non-planar toolpath. This whole algorithm is generic, meaning that it works for almost all of the meshes you can throw at it. The best way for me to demonstrate this was to slice the most challenging model I could think of, an upside down benchy. This is especially hard as there are overhangs which are greater than 90 degrees, which means that they are essentially printing in thin air, requiring the nozzle to point upwards. The algorithm identifies these sections by using the path to base property again, checking if it goes above the starting point. If it does, we know that the tetrahedron is printing in thin air and needs some extra rotation compensation. After a few iterations, we get this very splayed out benchy, which somehow doesn't have any overhangs. And when we slice and untransform it, we get this crazy looking toolpath where the walls are being printed downwards. I cheated a little bit by using a simplified benchy model to cut down on slicing times, which lacks many of the sharp features in the original model. But this model really stretches the limits on non-planar slicing, and I'm honestly really stunned that it was able to be printed at all. This is the culmination of months of work, and I'm really excited with how well it turned out. The hot end takes these crazy paths around the benchy to slowly build it up, layer by layer, without any overhangs, and it's just really fun to watch. Hopefully this shows how generic the S4 slicer is. And the fact that it's able to print this upside down Benchy means that most other models are a piece of cake in comparison. A lot of the fundamental concepts of this slicer came from the excellent work done by Zheng and Fang from Manchester University, who published a paper on optimization based non planar slices and released their open source code as the S3 slicer. I would highly recommend reading through their paper or at least skimming through the excellent diagrams. My slicer builds upon their work using some new ideas, but I think the biggest feature on my slicer is just how simple it is. It all runs from a single Jupyter notebook, allowing you to edit the code and create visualizations to really understand how all of it works. Anyway, that's why I named my slicer the S4 slicer, the simple S3 slicer. I hope that this simple open source code base allows others to easily modify it and try out their own ideas, pushing this under research field of non-planar 3D printing forwards. I hope you liked the video and sorry that it took so long to get out. I spent countless nights toiling away at that Jupyter notebook, slicing parts and printing them out, only for them to destroy themselves after two hours because of some bug in my code. But I'm really proud of the final product. I think that the combination of my very unique 3D printer, along with the crazy toolpaths generated by the S4 slicer, really are a sight to behold. I have tons of other projects planned for the future, so if you like what I do, feel free to subscribe. I have a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline, which you don't want to miss out on.